Hey everybody, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program RP0. We are uh, rejoining our crew out here at uh, Kawaii Protato Station. Uh, all seven of them, as we have now just uh, disembarked the station. And uh, this is the first uh, crewed shuttle flight uh, since the uh, Lifeguard 1 incident. Uh, just a quick check over our uh, rudimentary supplies, and then a uh, run over of... Um, our contract. So uh, we are fulfilling a three Kerbal to orbit contract with this mission, and uh, we are not shooting for a runway. As I mentioned uh, in the last, definitely last episode, probably the episode before that, but uh, we can wave goodbye to the now empty Kawaii Protato Station. It will just uh, kind of be on a standby hold until we can resolve some of our uh, issues around the moon. Those will uh, probably be the uh, next couple of launches we will be attending to uh, as so far as we can get them built before uh, other things in the space program start happening, like uh, arrivals at uh, other distant planets and such. And uh, this is our deorbit burn, bringing our periapsis down to uh, right around 50 kilometers, um, which is kind of the standardized approach for this vehicle. Um, we do have a very veteran flight crew, crew uh, as I mentioned last episode, Alice Campbell, postponing her retirement for another couple of weeks uh, just so she can fly this mission. And as we are just a uh, little bit uh, above Earth's atmosphere, we will uh, get ourselves turned around, get in a quick screeny, and uh, get our nose into the wind, as it were. Uh, we are high out uh, above the Atlantic. There's actually the uh, tip of Florida passing beneath us currently as we are making our approach to uh, the northern sands of Africa, uh, the largest runway that I, that we can try to hit. <laughs> it's long, it's flat, uh, I don't miss it very often, and uh, it's a really good training ground. It's kind of what I used to uh, prove the viability of the uh, shuttle program way back in the early days. So it's um, easy to hit and doesn't involve the pressures of actually touching that tiny, tiny strip of concrete. Uh, I do promise we will try to get back to more targeted and uh, runway landings later on. Uh, I just want to make sure that my new vertical speed indicator can be used uh, appropriately and uh, making sure that we can have nice, safe, easy touchdowns uh, from here on out. Uh, a little bit of uh, fuel balancing as we uh, jump into some physics warp for our uh, transatlantic crossing here, just making sure we can preserve a very uh, nice, uh, even and steady uh, nose-up vector here that will uh, help keep us aloft long enough to uh, actually get to our destination, which uh, does not seem to be a problem. Uh, we are targeting kind of right in the middle of the Sahara, so we should have uh, lots of room on any given side to maneuver uh, should we need to. Although I don't think we're actually going to need much of a diversion to make sure that we can find some place uh, nice and flat to touch this down. So uh, we will be crossing over uh, the border into Africa here shortly. And uh, we're going to start diverting a little north uh, just a bit. Uh, air brakes, nah, not so great for this angle. Cause a, a little bit of a yaw instability, but I think that's just more due to our angle of attack than the, uh, the brakes themselves. Since the, uh, the rudders... Uh, are activated with the uh, brake action group also. That means we basically don't have any uh, braking control <laughs> or uh, yaw control, sorry, while the brakes, uh, air brakes anyway, are, are being held. So uh, we'll take yaw control over uh, effectively slowing down, especially since we can slow down very effectively just by uh, trying to pivot into this turn. We'll get our nose up a little bit and try to bleed some of the speed. We're already down to about uh, 50 kilometers altitude. Uh, a little bit of fuel balancing help preserve our uh, angle of attack, yeah, which we can now kind of level off as we're down to about uh, almost 2,000 meters per second. And yeah, air brakes uh, cause a, a snap roll. But we were very uh, quickly able to recover. Probably shouldn't use air brakes in physical warp. That's just uh, really any change in heading in physical warp is just a, a very, very bad idea. So uh, other changes on this approach that we're going to be making versus our previous landings is instead of arming the chutes uh, manually, we're going to try to toggle them 
uh, toggle the release manually after our main gear has touched down. Um, just in case we do get a little bit of a bounce, the chutes aren't uh, slamming us backwards and throwing our nose gear into the dirt. So uh, we are pretty much on final approach now, coming into about uh, 10 kilometers uh, actual altitude and descending. Uh, we're going to try to look for someplace nice and flat, and um, that looks like a pretty good spot up ahead of us, although it's all cloud cover, every last bit of it. And so uh, hopefully we can uh, manage our uh, rate of descent and uh, get down beneath these clouds and, well, start our final approach. So here's uh, old me. Oh, I wish I'd picked a better landing site. Not all covered in clouds. All right, well, uh, coming up on three kilometers, uh, one, six, three kilometers per second, uh, descending at uh, about 18, almost 19 meters per second. Oh boy, I'm going to feel real dumb if a big hill comes and surprises us out of nowhere. Um, come on. Get below the cloud cover. Come on. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, 2.7 kilometers. Uh, still holding right around 160 kilometers per second. That should be fine. We should be able to lead off some of this. Uh, really, I think it's vertical speed that we need to keep in check more than anything upon touchdown. Uh, looks like we're coming through the clouds. Oh, boy. Uh, 2.3 kilometers. 159 meter per second. Uh... Alright, 2 kilometers now. Coming out from the cloud cover. 157.8 meter per second. Uh, we got some breathing room, so as long as there's not a giant hill, I think we'll be okay. God, the clouds just go all the way to the ground. Great. 1.7, landing gear, down and locked. Alright, let's get that sink rate under control. Less than 10. Less than 10. There we go. Nice and gentle. 1 meter per second sink rate. 130 meter per second across the ground. Touchdown. Shoot. Deploy. Brakes. 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 Perfect. Absolutely textbook. Now, if we could just do that on a runway. All seven of our crew are home safe. Uh, that is a successful flight. That's how it should look every time. I mean, there should be concrete under it when it touches down. But other than that, that's how it should look every single time. <laughs> oh, that vertical speed indicator is absolutely perfect. And, uh, yeah, micro beaters per second. I guess that's suspension travel. Or the sand shifting underneath us. Either way, it doesn't matter much. We're going to go ahead and recover this vessel and then uh, move on to uh, other things. And, well, it seems the uh, very next thing that our space program has to uh, take care of is our uh, Jovian Moon Surface Explorer. Of course, uh, this thing has launched quite a while ago, but it has just made its SOI change into uh, Jupiter. Uh, it's SOI, and uh, this is actually a contract mission to uh, land on Callisto. Now, this is a carbon copy of the vessel that we uh, landed on Ganymede. I mean, at this point, it's been a couple of years, at least, ago. Um, so it should, given enough time and enough gravity assists, uh, be able to land on Callisto without uh, too much problem. Although, I think I do remember us having a, a bit of an issue with the transfer window. Uh, oh no, we got 4,700 meters per second left in our primary tank, and there's probably another uh, 2,300 meters per second or so in the uh, lander itself. Hopefully we can use absolutely all of that to land on Callisto, uh, maybe even starting our descent burn uh, with our primary stage. But of course, step one, get into orbit of Jupiter. Step two, resolve your relative inclination with Callisto. Step three, gravity assist 
down to a much, much lower orbit so that uh, hopefully we can get a tang tangential... Gen uh, never mind. So that we can get it captured around Callisto uh, eventually. Um, I don't remember the specifics exactly, but from the way this flight plan is set up, it does look like our primary target for gravity assist was Io, and we'd just uh, we'd correct or orbit here, correct inclination, reduce this periapsis to uh, an appropriate level so that we can use Io to uh, continually gravity assist, bringing our apoapsis down to a reasonable level when we will start boosting it back up to uh, normalize our orbit with Callisto, maybe even bringing it down so far as to use Callisto itself to uh, raise our orbit until we can finally capture. This will be a multi-year process. A lot of uh, node tinkering and other things uh, will be necessary, but uh, I guess for the time being, we're just going to go ahead and warp through these next uh, two weeks uh, or so until we can get to the point where we're going to make our burn. Of course, uh, looks like Kerbal Alarm Clock has other ideas. It is interrupting our time warp. That was unexpected. This is literally the next thing on the list. So unless this is a pad refurbishment or a rocket completing, I'm going to be absolutely surprised. Oh, maneuver note. I guess I gave myself lots of uh, lead time on this. So there's that. All right, eight more days. Man, did I set that up so that I could adjust it later? Man, I don't remember. <laughs> One more day to go. Uh, we've already got our fuel unlocked. RCS and SAS are on, so I really should not have to worry about much else. Oh, is our engine active? That would be, yes, it is, because it's on down here. We should be good to go. 23 hours or so. Uh, let's see. It takes 26 minutes to displace 4.7 kilometers per second. We need to displace one-ish. 920, so yeah, you know, it's 47 divided by 26. About, I mean, <laughs> super roughly speaking, it's around two. I know I'm way off. That doesn't sound right. It doesn't seem like we should be able to displace a kilometer per second in two minutes. Given all of that. I'm going to give four minutes lead time and we'll see what happens when we light the engine. It is an AJ-10-118K, so it has uh, infinite ignitions. We could just beat on that engine until it, you know, well, I mean forever. It's never going to quit. Oh, come on. What now, Kerbal Alarm Clock? Oh, a vessel has been completed. Uh, what did I just do? No. No. Uh, focus view. Thank you. Okay, 17 more hours to kill. All right, we are five minutes out. Let's go ahead and get ourselves angled in. Where did my node go? There she is. Fantastic. All right, and if you could just be so kind as to hold the maneuver node, please. Ella, Jolla, Jolla, just give it a test light. Yeah, 10 minutes, nine seconds. So uh, we're just gonna run with it. Seems fair. And this uh, AJ-10-118K uh, proving to be Absolutely infallibly reliable. We'll uh, grab a couple of screenshots as I accidentally uh, switch out to the map view and then uh, just uh, kind of admire the view. Um, all things considered, we really could have done this orbital insertion a whole lot lower, but I think we are trying to uh, set ourselves up for many, many gravity assists and not having to make that extra burn later on. But um, I don't know. We're coming up on capture, so uh, I'm going to turn you right back over to old me. All right, we're going to shut it down just a little bit early. Let's go ahead and clear that node. And then uh, let's uh, resolve our relative inclination here. It's only about 20 degrees, and that far out, it should be extraordinarily cheap. Come on, KSP, that was uncalled for. Well, 
Well, it looks like it's out here somewhere. Yep. 0.175.1 meter per second in 246 days. <laughs> uh, at some point, I'm going to... Uh, oh, and that raises that periapsis. Let's uh, slow that down a bit. 2.6 degree. Oh, no, no. Okay, so that takes it up to 225.6 meter per second and brings us uh, within the orbit of Io. So let's set that as our target for right now. And uh, see, well, that's actually a little too low. All right, well, it looks like decimal two is the lowest it's going to give me. So uh, we'll stick with that for right now. Uh, let's see if that gives us an encounter in a lap or two. We could probably tune one here. Ah, 2,000 days, jeez. We're, I don't know if we can wait that long. We might make a breaking pass next orbit. But uh, 246 days, let's set up the alarm. And maneuver node. Add alarm. There we go. That's done. What do we have coming up before that? Uh, Chestnut gets to Mars. Chestnut makes a maneuver. Uh, our snack missiles get to Mars. Resupply gets to Mars. James May will arrive at Neptune. Well, that's interesting. And then we can do this. And then we have a Venus transfer. And then Tom Ball's ambassador will get to Pluto. Oh, no. James May will get... Yeah, Neptune. Definitely Neptune. Herp derp. And then our uh, Jasper mission will get here in to Jupiter in another year. And uh, Origami 4 Titan, which has been flying for almost a decade now, will get to Saturn shortly thereafter. And our Saturn Moon Surface Explorer missions, which um, those are in some trouble, uh, about a year and a half later than that. And then uh, Legacy missions after, after that. So well, we're going to have an eventful uh, early 90s. That's for sure. Well, uh, I'm glad this orbital insertion went well. I'm glad our DV figures are looking pretty good. So I'd say uh, all in all, we are squarely on track. It's, uh, it's good to put a couple in the win column for a change. So that's going to do it for this episode, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out. I really do appreciate it. And I will see all of you in the next one. So until then, see you later.